Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024. And we are smack in the middle of the greatest story God ever told. I'm gonna wait a few minutes to see who can join. If you're here, say hi. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Hi, Betty June. Booker Tove. Just going to give it one more minute. It is a cloudy day here in New York. And I'm so glad we didn't have a day like this on Eclipse Day. Eclipse Day was magnificent for me. I felt so much that day. I blocked out on my schedule. It is a gift to be here. Steve, you are right. What a gift. That's what today's class is really about. Um, I just want to recap a little bit about Eclipse Day, what it was for me. Um, and hopefully you guys had similar experiences. So I left my office, I blocked out that time, and I went to a big fat tree in the parking lot behind my office. Um, it's kind of hidden away, it's in its own little nook. And I put my head to the tree, I communed with the tree for a little while, I, put my, I took my shoes off, put my feet in the ground around the tree. Um, I thanked God, I thanked heaven and earth for that moment, I just put myself in a vibration of gratitude as high as I could get. And um, I brought my list of desires, personal desires for, for my life and for the collective that I had written down. I brought a bottle of water to hold on to, um, to hum into, and I brought my chauffeur. That was my armamentarium <laughs> that, I, that I brought as a spiritual warrior that we all are. Hi, Irma. Um, I said to him, I said the Psalms, I just I sat in meditation, talking to God. This is, that was my best meditation always. I just sit and talk to Hashem, tell Hashem what's in my heart. That's what I call meditation. Um, I sat there doing that. And then at the moment, at the four minutes and 28 seconds, I held my chauffeur up to the sky with my toes in the earth, my bare feet in the ground. And I pointed the chauffeur, which was a straight line, just like the planets that they were lined up in a straight line for all the Shefa to come funneling down to us. Usually the planets are in a zigzag. The Psalms, I said, Psalm 67, is to help align the planets so they don't have to go through the zigzag of the spheros. They can come to us in a straight line like the planets are the spheros. They were lined up that day. And hopefully the, we opened up that portal of blessings for humanity to come flooding in, pouring in, in a way that we can receive them with joy, with peace, with ease. And I blew that chauffeur so loud <laughs> that I thought somebody was going to call the cops. I was like scared afterwards. I was like looking all around to make sure that nobody heard. Um, hi, Ruthie. Hi, Adina. Um, and then I couldn't stop. I couldn't help myself after that. I was just, I, I was just blowing the chauffeur on and off for those four minutes and then humming in between. And I haven't stopped buzzing since, like my whole body. As I talk about it now, I can bring back the buzzing. My, my whole body just was a buzz. And it was a wonderful day. And I think we grounded a lot of the energies, the good, good energies into, into planet Earth, the Gaula energies. Um, today, I want to talk about a very important topic. I think the most important topic that we can be discussing now. And that is... Why is the human being the most important creation in all the universes, not just on planet Earth? The human being
has something special. And I want to play for you guys. It was so funny. It was such a divine redundancy. I'm going to play two clips for you. One from Sasha Stone and one from Rabbi Gozlan. And they both said the same thing. Rabbi Gozlan on this week's Parsha and Sasha Stone in recapping his experience of the eclipse. They said the same thing. So um, that's why I focused this week's class on this topic. Why is man, why are we the heroes of the galaxy? And we don't even know it. We don't even know it. And that's why we are it. It's in the not knowing is why we are the greatest movers of creation. It's the free will. It's all about the free will. Before I play those videos, I want to tell you guys a story. I'm going to talk off the cuff for a little bit. This is the plan for today. I'm going to talk off the cuff, tell you my thoughts, my ideas. I'm going to play some videos. I'm going to recap some of Rabbi Gozlan's class on this week's Parsha, Tazria. I'm going to read inside the Zohar. And then maybe, just maybe, I'm going to read again. I'm going to start again one chapter of Enoch. I can't resist. I, mean, I have to go back and start at the beginning with Enoch. So that's on tap for the next hour. Thank you so much for being with me to learn the Holy Kabbalah. May Kabbalah, our learning of Kabbalah, bring down blessing, protection for us, our families, our communities, and the, all of the world, all of the galaxies out there. Our learning of the Zohar is so holy. Our choosing to sit here and spend this time. God and the angels are with us listening because they're curious what we're going to say. I learned that from Ruthie. So um, a story. I'm going to tell you guys a story. I was supposed to have a session with this woman in Israel and she canceled on me. She said her daughter just found out that her good friend was killed in Gaza. Her daughter's good friend was killed. And she was too distraught to have the session with me. And I, I said, of course. And then I couldn't help myself. And it probably wasn't the right thing to do, but I just couldn't stop. I had just had a conversation with my other friend in Israel, Tziona. And she goes to listen to Rabbi, not Rabbi, Moshe Feiglin, a politician in the Knesset in Israel. And he is the only one going public saying, what is he saying? We should not be fighting this war. We should not be sending our boys into Gaza, into a death trap. We were baited into this war. Those gates were left open. Those hostages were allowed to be taken. And now we're sending more boys to be killed in a fruitless war, in a war that has no end, in a war that has no point. You can't kill terrorism. Terrorism is an ideology. You can't kill it by killing ants. When you kill one terrorist, five more pop up in his place. It is a game of whack-a-mole. It's futile, it's never ending, and it is dangerous. And our boys are being sacrificed and slaughtered. And he is saying this, and it is brave. And I'm saying it too. I said it from day one. I want to go on record. I said, do not do this. Do not take orders from a government that allowed that initial attack to take place. And here we are six months later and people are waking up. So I said, I sent her a clip from Moshe Feiglin speaking. I sent her a letter from a soldier who wrote to Moshe Feiglin saying, they're sending us on missions that make no sense. They're changing the protocol. They're endangering our lives. Nothing makes sense. The soldiers themselves are waking up. This friend said to me, she texted me. I said, why are we in this war? She goes, she said the words. She said, we have no choice. We have no choice. And then I remembered hearing those words in COVID. 
about the vaccine and the masks. We have no choice. We want to keep our job. We have no choice. We want to go on vacation. We have no choice. I want to walk around Walmart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I remember walking around Walmart without a mask and I was the only one. And my kids were embarrassed. And I want to say something really important. Every time you do something that is different than the crowd, because you see the truth in it, because you see the godliness in it, because you see you are aligning yourself with Hashem in that moment, that is a moment of malchus. That is a moment of malchus. That is a moment of personal sovereignty. Faglin, Moshe Faglin was saying, sit in jail to the soldiers, sit in jail, go against orders. It has, it couldn't have repercussions. You know, people lost jobs in, in COVID. People walked away from things. And it was hard. But inside those moments of malchus, you anchor in Mashiach. Mashiach energy is malchus energy. You become a match for Mashiach energy. And it is our accumulated moments of malchus over lifetimes, not just this lifetime, over many lifetimes, these moments of malchus, when you make a decision for yourself to align, align your life with purpose, with your purpose, with your soul's mission, with God, with what you know to be right, and you go against the orders, and you go against the, what the crowd is doing, what groupthink is doing. You just acquired for your soul a moment of malchus. And all these moments stack up to make your soul a match for Gula. And it's never too late to start having these moments. I had this moment yesterday. I had this moment yesterday when I had my meeting with my accountant, which is the most terrifying meeting I have every year where I sit down and he would go through everything. And I, yes, Ruthie, that's when being stiff necked has total value. Stiff necked for God. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Kishay Oref. Stubborn for God. Immovable for God. So I was. I felt myself getting those familiar nerves driving to the accountant. And this is a moment of malchus because a year ago, me and my husband, who are in different pages, separated and we file separately because I couldn't sit there in the same meeting. We are not on the same page. So I sat there in full um, appreciation of myself for saying, let's file separately. Let's keep the peace in our marriage. So I, and it was a fun meeting because of that. The tension was, there's no tension in the room. I was playful with the accountant. Thank God I love this accountant because he does what I ask him to do. And I sat there anchoring in my mouth, was telling him, we're going to do X, we're going to do Y, and we're going to do Z. And he said, okay. He tried scaring me a little bit. But I said, nope, it's all going to be good. It's all going to be okay. This is what I'm doing. And it was huge, a huge moment of mouth that I acquired from my soul. And when God says he's going to give Tzadikim 310 planets to rule in the times of Mashiach, it is because we have acquired these moments of Malchus. We proved ourselves when we're submerged here in the dark. No idea who we are, where we are, what we are. No idea, a blank slate, total amnesia. And we do these things to prove our Malchus, to prove our sovereignty. We're proving ourselves to God. This is the test. Are you sovereign enough to be a match for Mashiach? So when these choices come up in your life, take small steps towards sovereignty. And it builds on itself. It builds the muscle.
The next interesting thing that I want to talk about is hope. Schiffer Hendry texted me early this morning about hope. And I took that as a sign to talk about it because it had been brewing in my consciousness about hope. Why? Because I had this thought that those of us, you guys out there, listening, we are the leading edge, the advancing front, the highest apex of consciousness right now on the planet. Why? What's special about us? And I'm not saying it in arrogance. I'm just, I put the pieces of the puzzle together. What elements about our group here makes us the leading edge? Two things. We have hope. And what does the hope do? The hope allows us to see Q, to see the Q movement. You can only perceive the Q movement if you haven't become too hardened and too bitter and too doomsday. You can understand that there are good guys on the field in charge of the field. The White Hat's running the show. You can only do that if you have hope. Tremendous vast volumes of hope inside your consciousness. Because trust me, I try. I try to explain Q to people and it's just, it's, I'm like, am I talking English? Like, it's, you remember with the vaccine, you're like, is, what's coming out of my mouth? Is it English? Is it some other language? Why is there like a blank stare on the other side? And then I realized they, people cannot even hear you about Q if they are scared, if they are, have no hope, if they're afraid, terrified of having hope, terrified of allowing themselves to see that the, there are good guys. So we see Q because of our hope, our ability to hope, and we have Torah. We have Torah. Torah and Q, Kabbalah, especially the Sod of Torah, and the hope of Q together, guys, we're the tippy top, the tip of the spear. We are, not afraid to say it. Chanoch. Sefer Chanoch, I didn't know how it was going to end, guys. I did not read ahead. And I cried my way through that last paragraph because it was about the Torah in our hands today. Musha Kibel Torah Misina, Misarel Yoshua, Vili Yoshua, Zikainu, Zikainu, Lanchik, Nesasai, you know, the whole chain of transmission to the actual physical book. We went from the metaphysical, other world, otherworldly, insane, um, you know, visual the visualization of that other world is, is, is so over the top. It's hard to it's hard to understand and fathom. But it ends in a very grounded way by telling us the level, the steps of transmission of the codes to mankind. We have it in our hands. We have the Torah. This is what makes mankind the most important creation. No other planet, no other galaxy, no other dimension has the Torah. None. It was given to the dumbest, the most dense creation. Because we have the most free will to choose it. It is choice that makes us so powerful. The choice for Malchus, the choice to sit and study Torah is Malchus. Of all the things you could be doing this morning, this is Malchus. I had an analogy come to me because I was talking to my sister Miriam and I was telling her this thought and she's so brilliant. She just like lets out these one-liners that I'm like, 
that was brilliant. So I said, can you believe we have the Torah? Like, it's crazy that we have the nuclear football, like, like God's encryption of the source of reality. It's the source code of reality, you know, like the, the code of computers, like how do, how do computers work because of this mumbo jumbo? The Torah is the source code of reality. How reality around us exists is coded in the Torah. And she goes, Miriam goes, yeah. And we're like, we don't even know what we have. We're dumb. So then the analogy I thought of was, it's like having a garment. God gave us a garment. And we've passed down this garment through all the generations. Each one of us can wear it. But what we don't understand is that sewn into the lining of the garment are diamonds, diamonds, like sheets and sheets of diamonds sewn in. And the enemy knows they cannot wear this garment. They're not a match, doesn't fit them. So the only way that the enemy can succeed is by getting us to not want to wear the garment, getting us to try and alter the, the garment, make changes to the garment. Or making us not even want to wear it at all, you know? Saying that there's more interesting things out there to wear. But once we understand what we possess, the vast fortune embedded in this garment we realize how fortunate we are to have gotten something directly from God. We are the only planet that got something from God, meaning it says the Torah and Hashem are one. Hashem and the Torah are one. Whatever the Torah is, Hashem is. We're wearing God. We're doing God. And that's why it said Na'asev and Nishma. I think Ruthie said that last week in a, com in a comment, Na'asev. We will do. It is in the doing, the nishma, and then we will listen. But we will always jump to do. What also makes this world so unique and the hub of creation is this Evan Hashasiya, the foundation stone, the rock that is here. probably inside inner earth with all the kalim in the bird's nest. But this rock, God cracked it off his throne and put it here on earth. I don't think he did that for any other planet. These are big ideas, guys. These are huge. Once we understand, you know, I hear people say in the spiritual community, remember who you are, remember who you are. I'm like, what does that even mean? Who are we? And now I understand who we are. We are the dumbest creatures in all of creation, gifted with the potential for the greatest holiness. And the mechanism to acquire the holiness is free will, is choice. So that woman in Israel, I said to her, we have a choice. We always have a choice. Whenever that refrain comes up in your own head, but I don't have a choice, know that that is your moment. That is your pivot moment to say, I do have a choice. And let me take the choice that is the most powerful for, my, for sovereignty, for myself. Woo, okay. <clears throat> the next thing I want to do is play a two videos for you guys. 
one from Sasha Stone and one from Rebecca goes on saying the same thing about man, how man is the most important creation in all the galaxies. Um, yeah, hold on. To activate that morphogenetic upshift, which doesn't just impact and affect us individually or um, societally, or even as a genus, it actually affects the entire cosmos. Mm -hmm. It is my reckoning and my knowing that Tara, Earth, this plane of existence, is at the is the epicenter of all temporal expression. I am now in my middle age, absolutely uh, in my knowing on this. I don't need to even engage any further discussion or debate on the matter. And these. Um, Folks who maintain this somewhat entropic notion that um, that we're, we're not alone in the galaxy. Of course, we're not fucking alone in the galaxy. That's not the point. The point is, uh, a lot of pundits will will, in a sense, diminish the importance of the human and say, "Well, we're just another squawking and grunting uh, m mammal on the surface of planet somewhere on the fringes of the Milky Way." No, I think not. I think we are we have invested in us the entirety, the whole of the mind and the heart of God, so to speak, the Alpha and the Omega. Now we may be eclipsed to that majesty by 97 or 98 or 99.999%, but the latency, the potency is there. Sasha Stone gets it. <laughs> He's basically saying in much better language than me, exactly the same point I'm trying to make. Um, let me now play for you guys. Rebbe goes on. This is about three minutes and you need to read the subtitles. He's speaking in Spanish. So, um, follow along in the subtitles. Hold on. Let's try that again. Dice el Zohar Akadosh, todo lo que existe en este mundo, y cuando dice el mundo no está hablando de la Tierra, está hablando de todas las galaxias, está hablando de todas las dimensiones, está hablando de todas las criaturas físicas y no físicas. Todo lo que existe en la creación solo ha sido creado para el hombre. A ver quién me explica eso. Si parecemos nosotros ni, ni la punta de un alfiler con, res, con respecto a la, imans, la inmensidad de las galaxias y de los universos, no somos nada. Pues, ¿qué tiene que ver todos los universos? Y ya no son universos, son multiversos con nosotros. ¿Por qué eso también ha sido creado para nosotros? Eso quería decir que hay solamente que los seres vivos o humanos solamente están en la Tierra, no habría otro planeta. Porque hay otros seres hay otros seres fuera de este planeta. Pero esos también han sido creados para el hombre. Y todo lo que ha sido creado en la creación ha sido creado para el hombre. Para que es... el hombre lo descubra. No, dice que no hay ni un trocito de césped que crezca, que no haya una estrella que le diga crece. Y nosotros somos toda la creación enfrascada en un santuario que somos nosotros. O sea, toda la creación está hecha en un micro multiverso que somos nosotros toda la creación o sea, está la creación a nivel grande y está la creación a nivel muy pequeñito y compacto que somos nosotros y somos el reflejo exacto de toda la creación luego todo lo que nosotros movemos inmediatamente actúa en toda la creación en efecto dominó somos el teclado de la creación 
Por eso lo que hablamos, lo que pensamos, lo que decimos, lo que tocamos, tiene un impacto enorme en toda la creación, en todos los universos, en todos los seres creados corporales y no corporales. No somos conscientes de la enorme responsabilidad que tenemos en cada pensamiento, acto, palabra y acción. No tenemos ni idea. Y aquí lo dice. How good was that, guys? How good was that? Every act, thought, speech, everything we touch, everywhere we go, we are the keyboard of creation. That analogy is huge. We're sitting here, I have my keyboard. What we think we type in to creation affects everything out there. Us tiny little, the, the tip of a pin, he says. We think we're nothing. We are everything. And it's the fact that we don't know it gives us this power. But when we could remember little whiffs of it, we can become conscious creators. Conscious creators. Be hopeful. Be in a good mood. Be sovereign. And watch what happens to the world. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to do is read from the Zohar. Where did I put my Zohar? Okay. Ooh, it's so powerful. I'm like buzzing from all those topics. Okay, this is Parsha's Tazria. You guys ready? This is the holiest, most sovereign thing we could do right now is to study the secrets of Torah. Because this is the dress they didn't want us to wear. This is the thing that empowers us to know what's really going on. It says in Tehillim 25:14, Sod Hashem li Re'av. I got this from Rabbi Gozlan. The secrets of Hashem li Re'av are given to those in awe of Him. Rabbi Gozlan said, We send the quantum field an emotion and it returns to us a situation and that's the biggest secret to know because you master your emotions through your thoughts if a woman conceives seed here we go we have learned that if a woman conceives the seed first the child is a male the zohar says it it's a secret recipe. Said Rev Aha, but we have have we not learned that God decrees whether the semen is to be male or female? Rev Yossi replied, Indeed, God distinguishes whether the germ itself comes from a male or female source. And therefore God decrees whether the child is to be male or female. Rev Aha also said, Why is the word conceive seed used instead of merely conceive? Rev Yossi answered, A woman from the time she becomes pregnant until the time she is delivered can speak of nothing but the child she is to bear and whether it be a boy or a girl. So, this is the place in the Zohar that we learn that when a woman, when a man is not selfish in bed and the woman orgasms first, it's going to be a boy. Rev Chizkia adduced here in the verse, O oh, oh Lord, how manifold are thy works. That's in the Psalms. Marabu Masecha, Marabu Masecha, he said, are the works of the Holy King in the world. He is like a man who takes in his hand a number of bundles of seeds and sows them all at once. And in time, each of its kind comes up separately. So the Holy One, blessed be he, accomplished his work with wisdom. With wisdom, he took all together 
and sowed them. And afterwards, they all issued each in its own time. As it is said, in wisdom hast thou made them all. Rev Abba said, they were all secreted in wisdom. And they did not issue into being saved by certain paths alongside Bina. This is the path the soul comes into the world through the path of Bina. Once they become firmly established, observe that when a man goes to unite with his wife in sanctity, in sanctity, a man's holy thought, what he's thinking during sex, awakens a spirit compounded of male and female. And then God signals to a malach, to an angel, to a messenger, who is in charge of the conception of human beings and entrusts to him that spirit and informs him where to deposit it and also lays various injunctions on that spirit itself. Then the spirit goes down to earth along with a certain form, which is bore its image above. So there's a form of us above us, a matching form, the oversoul, the super soul. And in that form, it is created and goes about in this world. So we are the mini me of that bigger form. So long as that greater form is with a man, he retains his form in this world. And I heard Rabbi goes on. I just want to explain a little bit about that from what I heard. It calls Hashem Tzur. Hashem is the rock. And Rabbi Gozlan, let me just get my notes on that. Rabbi Gozlan was saying about that. Tzur is Hashem's name. It means sculptor. God is the sculptor. And God created the image of our higher self, which is more wise, more connected, more beautiful, more kind, more generous. It is the best version of ourself. Our job in this smaller self is to make choices that align to the image of that higher, more perfect self. I also love Tzur, the name of Hashem Tzur, because that's my grandson's middle name. And my daughter said it just came to her in a dream. Okay, back to the Zohar. In the book of this, okay, this is so interesting, you guys. In the book of the Sorceries of Ashmadai, we find that one who knows how to practice magic from the other side, the side of the left, should arise by the light of the lamp and utter certain incantations and call forth the unclean side by their name and prepare his forms for those whom he invites and say he is ready for their commands. Then that man passes out of the dominion of his master of God and places himself in charge of the unclean in the in the charge of the unclean side and through his incantations two spirits appear in the shape of men which show him how to confer certain benefits or do certain kinds of harm at certain spe specified times it is forbidden to a man to abandon any vessel in his house to the possession of the other side for many emissaries are in wait to punish such an act and from that time, blessings do not rest upon him. All the more if he assigns to the other side the most precious part of himself. From that time, he belongs to it. And when the time comes for the celestial form which has been given him to depart from this world, the evil spirit to which he clung comes and takes it. And it is never again restored to him. Guys, this is what this is this is Hollywood. This is politicians. This is what's still happening today. This is spirit cooking. What's her name? Marina Abramovich. There's all of this underworld stuff is still happening. And it is as old as time. When the soul is about to descend to this world, 
it first goes down in the, into the terrestrial garden of Eden. And what does it see there? It sees the glory of the souls of the righteous. And then it goes to Gehenna to see the wicked who cry, whoa, whoa, and they find no compassion. That holy form stands by him until he emerges into the world. After which it keeps him company and grows up with him. Observe, all spirits are compounded of male and female. And when they go forth into the world, they go forth as both male and female. And afterwards, the two elements are separated. If a man is worthy, they are afterwards united. And it is then that he truly meets his soulmate. And there is a perfect union in spirit and flesh. Hence it is written, when a woman conceives seed and bears a male and not a male and female together, since on account of the ways of the world, they are not united at birth as they were when they issued from on high, because the first man and his mate sinned before God. Therefore they are separated until if a man is worthy, it pleases God to restore him to his mate. But if man is not worthy, she is given to another. Rev. Eliezer said, This is not so. All at first comprise both male and female, and they are separated afterwards. But if the woman bears a male, then they are united from the side of Chesed. And if she bears a female, this side is then predominant. Hence, if the male child issues from the side of the left, he is effeminate. But if from the side of the right, he has mastery over the female. Okay, next topic in the Zohar. Rev. Abba then discoursed on the verse. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. Genesis 32, 26. This is when... Jacob was fighting with the angel. Why was not the angel able to prevail over Jacob? Because the sun had arisen and his strength was crippled. For when the light appears, all the emissaries of punishment are restrained. And then the community of Israel communes with the Holy One, blessed be he. That's why we're learning at the break of dawn, because this is the most mercy-filled hour of the day. At that hour is a time of grace for all. And the king holds out to her and all who are with her his scepter of the thread of grace so that they may be wholly united to the holy king. Observe this. When the holy one, blessed be he, is in the company of the community of Israel. If she makes the first move, if she makes approaches to him, if we reach out to Hashem first, and draws him towards her in the strength of her love and her desire, then she is replenished from the side of mercy. And multitudes uh, from the side of the right are found in all worlds. But if the Holy One, blessed be he, has to make the first move, is the first to make advances, and she only rouses herself afterwards, then all is on the side of Gavura, the side of the female, and many multitudes arise on the side of the left in the world. Hence it is written, when a woman conceives seed and bears a male, the lower world being on the model of the upper, and in all things a man should concentrate his thoughts above on the Holy One, blessed be he, that grace may abound in the world. Happy are the righteous, who know how to concentrate their thoughts on Hashem. For it is written, Ye who cleave to the Lord, your God, are alive, all alive this day. Deuteronomy 4.4 Deuteronomy 4.4 
his other son then cited the verse. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Man was formed with two inclinations, the good and the evil, one corresponding to water, one to fire. The word man, Adam, indicates a combination of male and female. The dust which man was formed was from that of the holy land, of the sanctuary. Then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is the holy soul which derives from the life above. And the man became a living soul. He was provided with the holy soul from the supernal living being, which the earth brought forth. Now, as long as that holy soul is attached to a man, he is beloved of his master. He is guarded on all sides. He is marked for good above and below. And the holy divine presence rests on him. But if he perverts his ways, the divine presence leaves him. The super soul does not cling to him. And from the side of the evil serpent, a spirit arises, which can abide only in a place where heavenly holiness has departed. So a man becomes defiled and his flesh, his facial appearance and his whole being is distorted. This is leprosy. This is what this week's parsha is talking about, the Mitzorah. Observe that because this living soul is holy, therefore when the holy land absorbs it, it is called super soul, neshama. It is this which ascends and speaks before the holy king and enters without hindrance into all gates and therefore is called the speaking spirit. Hence the Torah proclaims, this is how we protect our soul, guys. Keep thy tongue from evil, because if a man's lips and tongue speak evil words, these words mount aloft and proclaim, keep away from the evil word of so-and-so, and leave that path clear for the mighty serpent. Then the holy soul leaves him, and he is not able to speak. The soul is in shame and distress, and is not given a place as before. Hence it is written, who keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from trouble. That's Proverbs 21, 23. For that soul which was vocal is reduced to silence on account of speaking an evil word. word. Then the serpent gets ready. And when the evil word finds its way to him, then many spirits bestir themselves. And one spirit comes down from that side and finds the man. One spirit, guys, comes down and finds that man who uttered the evil word. This is what I heard David Guillaume say on Instagram. He said that with every, your speech either creates a good angel or a bad angel. And if you have negative speech, you're gossiping, fear mongering, whatever it is you're doing with your, with your mouth that isn't holy, you're creating one angel that will come down and give you one moment of pain. For every single word that you say, bad word you say, negative speech, which there are seven categories for, you create an angel that's going to bring you one moment of pain. Just as a man is punished for uttering an evil word, word, so he is punished for not uttering a good word when he had the opportunity. Because he harms that speaking spirit which was prepared to speak both above and below in holiness. Your oversoul is waiting for you to speak holy words. All the more so if people walk in crooked ways. And he is able to reproach them, reprove them, and does not. So if we see people doing something evil or bad or wrong, and we don't say something, we're also held accountable for that. You got to see something and say something. Next topic. Similarly, whenever anyone makes a thing for idolatrous worship, when someone makes an idol or for the other side, as soon as he mentions its name in connection with that thing, an unclean spirit rests upon it. Now the, the Canaanites were idolaters. And whenever they erected a building, guys, this is so pertinent for our times, all the Masonic temples everywhere and 
all these buildings that have to come down, the 34 buildings that will come down. And this Zohar tells us why. You ready to learn this? This is big. Now the Canaanites were idolaters and who, wherever they erected a building, they used, to, uh, they used to utter certain idolatrous formulae and a spirit of uncleanness rested on the building. When the Israelites entered the land, God desired to purify them and sanctify the land and prepare a place for his divine presence. And so through that plague of leprosy, see, God would show them where the evil was in the building through leprosy. He would demarcate the building. Through the plague of leprosy, they used to pull down the buildings which had been erected in uncleanness. Now, If they had done so merely that they might find hidden treasures, they would have replaced the stones afterwards. But the text says, and they shall take out the stones and take out the mortar in order that the unclean spirit may pass away and the holiness return and the Shekhinah abide in Israel. Therefore, therefore, when a man begins to set up a building or build his home, he should declare that he is building that home in the service of God. Then the support of heaven is with him. And God assigns holiness to him and bids peace with him. Otherwise, he invites into his house the other side. All the more so if his inclination is to the other side. For then, indeed, an unclean spirit will rest on that house. And that man will not leave this world until he has been punished in that house. And whoever dwells in, in that house may come to be hurt. If it is asked, how is one to know such a house? It is one in which man who has built. Okay. It is one in which the man who has built it has come to harm. He or his family, whether through sickness, loss of, or loss of money. He and two others after him. Better a man should fly to the mountains or live in a mud hut than dwell in that house. So this is practical advice from the Zohar. When you go to buy a house. You need to ask who owned this house and what happened to them. What was their fate? Were they successful in life? Was there a divorce? This is what Rabbi Gozlan said. Was there a divorce? Was there a murder? What happened in this house? You need to find out the history of the house before you buy a house. Therefore, God had pity on Israel, who knew nothing of all those houses when they entered Israel from the Canaanites. And he said, you do not know, but I know. And I will indicate which houses are contaminated with by putting Tzoraas, the plague of leprosy, on them. There is a plague in the house. And here is a greater plague which will drive it out. Hence, he shall break down the house, the stones and the timber thereof. We may ask... Since the uncleanness has gone, why should he have to break down the house? The reason is, as long as the house stands, it belongs to the other side and at any time may return to that side. If that is the case in the Holy Land, how much more so in other lands, said Rev, said Rev Eliezer, especially since the evil spirit calls his companions there. And even a hawk's talons could not scratch out the uncleanness from there. Therefore, the scripture says, Woe to him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. That's a big one. Okay, last one today from the Zohar, you guys. Last little bit that I wanted to read you. Rev Abba discoursed on a verse. And this is so good. This is such a beautiful way to end the Zohar today. You guys are going to love this. Yes, Ruthie, every town everywhere i've driven by i'm like that's another one and all the windows are shut the masonic lodges they're like bricked in there's no real windows it's so freaking creepy and i think god will show us like he did back then the same god who took us out of egypt Rev. Abba discoursed on the verse. As in the day of thy coming forth from the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. 
Micha 7.15. He said, God will one day bring deliverance to his sons as in the days when he sent to deliver Israel and inflicted plagues on Egypt for their sake. Now, what is the difference between this deliverance that we're living right now? This deliverance, where Q, where 200 army generals got together in the time of President Kennedy and hatched a plan to take out the heads of Amalek that had their tentacles wrapped around this planet. One by one, they peeled off that grip and they showed tremendous restraint. The Q plan understood it was a long game. It wasn't gonna be overnight. But they undertook the mission of Mashiach ben Yosef to eradicate evil from the planet. They took on the mission, the world's most biblical mission. And those of us who are not afraid to have hope can perceive the good guys on the field. Like Mel Carmine always says, he gave me that language, Mel Carmine. There are good guys on the field. And those of us that can perceive it are blessed because this is the military mechanism of Mashiach. The Mashiach ben Yosef phase one, Mashiach ben Yosef phase one of Geula. We are in the final days. Mashiach ben Yosef has been going on at least since President Kennedy. Well, maybe he's Mashiach ben Yosef. I still think it's Trump. Back to the Zohar. What is the difference between this deliverance and that of Egypt? The deliverance in Egypt was from one king and one country. Here it will be from all kings of the earth. Then God will be glorified in all the world. And all shall know God's dominion, as it is written, the Lord shall be king over the whole earth, Zechariah 14.9. And they shall bring Israel as an offering to the Holy One, blessed be he, as it is written, and they shall bring all your brethren, Isaiah 46.20. Then the patriarchs, the patriarchs shall rejoice to see the deliverance of their sons. And so it is written, as in the days of thy going forth from Egypt, I shall show him wonders. So that's the difference, you guys. Egypt was one king in one country. This is all kings, all countries. We're gonna be liberated to a scale we have never witnessed before. And the more that you conjure your sovereign energy, the more you will enjoy it. You will enjoy the ride. This is why man, this answers the question. This is why man is the most important creation in the universe. Because the more we conjure sovereignty in the dark through our free will, the more we make this planet and all of creation primed and ready for God's sovereignty for Malchus, because we're a match for it. And we are little mini versions of God. God put in us, Adam, the word Adam, man, mankind, is Aleph, Alufo shal, Adam, uh, shal Olam, the master of the universe, plus Dam, blood, which is mankind. Adam is God, God telling us that he put himself inside of us. And we know from Greg Braden, Inside our blood is the DNA. And the repeating pattern in the sulfide bond is God's own ineffable name. God coded it himself into Torah and he coded himself into us. And this is why the enemy went for the DNA and this is why the enemy goes for the Torah. Those are its biggest existential threats. And we just brought so much light into the world by acknowledging who we are and our powers and understanding that we don't have to be afraid. 
when we understand our creative power through our speech, thought, and action, you don't have to be afraid. Okay, let's finish out with Book of Enoch, one chapter. We're starting up again. We'll see if we get to finish it again. Book of Enoch, Book of Enoch. So the Book of Enoch is a trip Rabbi Yishmael took to heaven. I don't know how he got there. But when he got there, Hanoch took him on a tour. The Book of Enoch by Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, the high priest. Edited and translated by Hugo Odberg. Chapter 1, Introduction. Rabbi Yishmael, Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha ascends to heaven to behold the vision of the chariot, the Merkava, and is given to the charge of Hanoch, Metatron. And Enoch walked with God, and then he was not, for God took him. Genesis, verse 24. Rabbi Yishmael said, When I ascended on high to behold the vision of the Merkava and enter the six halls, the halls of Amante, one within the other, as soon as I reached the door of the seventh hall, I stood still in prayer before the Holy One, blessed be He, and lifting up my eyes on high, Towards the divine majesty, I said, Lord of the universe, I pray thee that the merit of Ar Aharon, the son of Amram, the lover of peace, the pursuer of peace, who received the crown of priesthood from thy glory on Mount Sinai, be valid for me in this hour, so that Kafsiel, the prince, and the angels with him may not get power over me, nor throw me back down from the heavens. For with the Holy One, blessed be he, sent to me, Metatron, the servant, Eved, the angel, the prince of presence. And he, spreading his wings with great joy, came to meet me, so as to save me from their hand. And Metatron took me by his hand in their sight, saying to me, enter in peace before the high and exalted king and behold the picture of the Merkava. Then I entered the seventh hall, and he led me to the camp of Shekhinah and placed me before the Holy One, blessed be he, to behold the Merkava. As soon as the princes of the Merkava and the flaming Seraphim perceived me, they fixed their eyes on me, instantly trembling and shuddering, seized me, and I fell down and was benumbed by the radiant image of their eyes and the splendid appearance of their faces, until the Holy One, blessed be he, rebuked them, saying, My servants, my seraphim, my keruvim, my ofanim, cover your eyes before Yishmael, my son, my friend, my beloved one, and my glory, that he may not tremble or nor shudder. For with Metatron, the Prince of Presence, came and restored my spirit and put me back on my feet. After that moment, there was there was not in me strength enough to say a song before the throne of glory of the glorious king, the mightiest of all kings, the most excellent of all princes, until after the hour had passed. After one hour had passed, the Holy One, blessed be he, opened to me. So he needed a break. He needed a nap, like an hour nap. I could so relate to that. After one hour, the Holy One, blessed be he, opened to me the gates of Shekhinah, the gates of peace, the gates of wisdom, the gates of strength, the gates of power, the gates of speech, the gates of song, the gates of kadusha, the gates of chant. And he enlightened my eyes and my heart by words of psalm, song, praise, exaltation, thanksgiving, extolment, glorification, hymn, and eulogy. And I, as I opened my mouth, uttering a song before the Holy One, blessed be He, the Holy Chayot, beneath and above the throne of glory, answered and said, Holy, and blessed be the glory of yod heh vav -Hey from His place. Baruch Hashem, Imakomo.
Okay, you guys. <laughs> Irma said, Hanoch is guiding us here every time you give us wisdom. I feel him here. I feel him too. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for getting it. Thank you for receiving these concepts and understanding them and understanding who you are, what your oversoul is, and how you are matching it just by being here. Next week, I'm gonna go live on Wednesday because we're leaving to Florida for Passover on Thursday. So I'm gonna see you guys next Wednesday. Have an easy day. Have a protected day. Have a guided day. Have a sovereign day. Mwah. Love you.